Hi everyone, it's Sabine van der Linden from Alchemy Crew. Today, I will be meeting with David Kwan from IBM. David is a thought after digital reinvention leader within IBM, working with US and international banks and insurance companies on their business transformation strategy. Today, we want to talk about a decade of societal change. We'll be covering trends, technology, millennials, and the elderly. So today, I'm with David Kwan from IBM, and we are going to talk about a decade of societal change, our insurance focusing their attention on the right priorities. So welcome, David. Well, thank you. So first, to get started, I would love you giving our audience a little introduction about who is David. Oh, well, so this is David. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I am IBM the Industry Academy member for insurance, which means that I represent some of the uh, leading thoughts at IBM globally when it comes to insurance. And I've also been in this industry for about 20 some odd years, I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, as a joke, I say, hey, I've been around since the Netscape days, for those who remember what that is. Um, so I've been with insurance and digital for some of, you know, in a while. So this is a topic of my interest um, and, uh, and, 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 and very exciting area as well, which we'll talk about through today. So thank you, David. And to get started, I would like to first ask you, you know, to talk about trends. So I think we need to just get back into understanding the trends we are coming out of and the impact of those trends in the insurance sector. So mm -hmm. what we have seen, as you know, is the current market forces are disrupting traditional insurers, right? And this is radical, it's direct, and it's actually also impacting internal cultures. I'm sure you remember the time where you used to buy insurance a long time ago. And some days we feel that it does not change much, right? Mm -hmm. And so what is your view, David, of the dynamics that are affecting us today? Can you please tell us what are some of the primary market forces that are impacting insurers? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think, let me touch on three things. Um, the first is kind of the, what I call the elephant in the room, the global pandemic, but at the same time, the miracle of science. So the COVID has exposed the vulnerability of interconnected world, right? If you remember when the COVID happened, the Western world got hit first and Western world suffered faster. And then it migrated its way toward the third world countries. So it kind of tells you the kind of the impact of the interconnectedness. And, but for US, uh, you know, we got to actually, to be honest, got a free pass on this, thanks to vaccine. You know, remember like in the beginning, we were the worst. <laughs> and if without the vaccine, we would just been like India or Brazil with increasing infection and people suffering through this. And, you know, but this event, once again, proved that science and technology are key to solving the toughest challenges in our society. But unfortunately, COVID is not done with us yet. So we're, we're learning about long-term damages to our heart muscle. We're learning about damages about the lung and increased chance of Alzheimer. And also we still have a lot of people who are unvaccinated as well. So that is kind of the impact of the COVID. The second is evolving customer expectation. The first is personalization. So mass personalization is a goal of every large insurance. Um, now, even not just for consumer products, but also insurers targeting the, you know, the B2B companies, the commercial lines as well. And it used to be a competitive differentiation, but now some level of personalization is just basic expectation, you know, like website addressing you with your first name. 
But now the technology has evolved to a point where there are videos um, where it can be produced for each person. So imagine you booked a travel to some paradise with your family, okay? And then you receive a video where the host welcomed you to the resort, walks you through its amenities, shows you the beach, and all the time it addresses you by your first name, it mentions your family, and welcomes you there. And that technology is actually possible in mass production. And video it actually offers that. So, and, and the next is the variety of digital channel that's proliferating. Okay. An interesting example is I think the Reddit Wall Street Bet. Okay. So the Reddit, if you'll remember, it's like, you know, it's like a bunch of forums with silly comments, right? I go in there to look for some funny stuff, you know, latest news and all that stuff. But now it is a new channel for investment news and engagement. I mean, you know, see, it, for example, like the meme stock, like AMC, you know, has created a lot of news and to a point where it is still at about $45. Remember, that was like $2 stock back in January. <laughs> and the third is the cookie-less world. Okay? So customer data acquisition is going through a major upheaval. Okay? So use people to buy third-party data to learn more about your customer and you know, uh, sell ad against that. But Apple now mandates that all iPhone apps has to seek clear customer consent before tracking, okay? And a lot of people are opting out, like I have. I have. Um, and Google will block third-party cookie. You know, they were gonna do it this year, not push to next year, but you know, it's coming. So the days of easily targeting users by buying third-party data is passing us quickly. This means the insurers need to now focus on first-party data that is, they need to now engage directly with the prospect and policyholders and get the data themselves through a deeper engagement and better experience. So that is fascinating because you have covered the pandemic and mass personalization, mm -hmm. as well as the fact that we can't just use data anymore. We need to be smart at using data. So to be more specific, David, mm -hmm. what does it mean in terms of insurance risks? What has changed for us now? Oh, absolutely. I think the, there is, we're beginning to see, or not just beginning to see, what's happening is that there is are a lot of emerging new risk pools, okay? I think the first good example and fun one is like a self-driving car. Okay? And that one is actually something that is happening right now. So did you know that there are really six levels of vehicle autonomy as defined by US Department of Transportation? Okay, let me explain what they are. Six level. Six levels. Okay, I want to hear what this is about. So level zero is like no time of automation. Okay, and then level five is full uh, vehicle automation. Okay, let me explain. So most new cars are level one. It's like cruise control, right? You can put that on, then you can kind of, you know, relax, you don't have to put on your XL. Just like a level one um, automation. So it's in most cars, okay? Now, level two is where you have some level of steering control, um, uh, offered where it keep, keeps your car in lane. So a lot of the kind of luxury cars have that feature now, right? Level three is when a car can now begin to react against changing environment, like slowing traffic, okay? And level four is where you hear about like a Waymo, like a self-driving taxi in, in Arizona from the, you know, uh, from the airport to hotel. So it doesn't require human intervention in most cases, and but then it still needs to operate only in a very well-defined limited environment. 
and level five is where there's no more steering wheel. <laughs> so it's like an elevator. You go in, you punch a button, and then it just takes you there. So um, see, see, I think the point that I was wanting to make with this level is that self-driving is really already a reality. It's not like a dream. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. We are there already. It's here. We're already using it. We just didn't realize it that that we were already doing this. And what what this does from the insurance perspective is really interesting. So up to level four, uh, where you still have some control, the liability is still with the driver. Okay. And but then you we realize that AI is taking bigger and bigger role in driving. So the interesting thing is that the insurance writer now has to begin to think about AI as a risk, just like the driver, because they're taking a more than driving. Now, at level five, where no steering wheel, then it becomes product liability. So the responsibility moves from the driver to the manufacturer, which is a completely different business. So, you know, and it also impacts like, you know, home and auto bundling. <laughs> what do you do? There's no more auto, it's all home. <laughs> so, and you know, the autonomous vehicle, you know, being more expensive when it gets an accident, at the same time, way more safer as well. So, which means that the kind of overall auto market will eventually shrink. So these are some of the impacts the insurers will see from kind of the product perspective. Can yeah. I ask you, because you have been talking about, mm -hmm. oh, but I can see the same metaphor applying to homes. Whilst, mm -hmm. I mean, we are going to start using more internet of things in our homes. Mm -hmm. And so if something breaks, is it my fault or the fault of the manufacturer if we are using all those gadgets now in um, our fridge, washing machine, tumble dryers, and so on and so on? Mm -hmm. I, it's a, um, I mean, it, it's a, if the product breaks, it, I mean, it depends on you know who broke it, obviously. You know, if it's a defect from the manufacturer, uh, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a warranty situation. If the human did it, so it's like a, you know, like a, um, a self-driving car, again, back to the example as to if driver did something to cause that damage, impact be a factor, then obviously driver would have a liability. But again, you know, in our hypothetical situation of completely self-driving car. So if you're just in a car um, and then the car was taking you someplace and then all you did was put punch in a destination, then, you know, it, you couldn't be at fault. So it becomes again a product liability situation. Yeah, interesting mm -hmm. lines. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and you know the other other kind of uh, risk trend emerging. The other famous one is I think technology risk. So it, one of the things that COVID did was uh, the accelerate the growth of e-commerce, right? So there, a, there is a uh, kind of the estimate that COVID had accelerated our e-commerce by about two years. The reason being, the, the right now, the e-commerce is about 20% of the overall commerce. And before COVID, the, uh, we thought that we reached that 20% in 2013 or later. So um, not 2013, not 2023, 2023 or later. So, the fact that we reached that two years early kind of gives you anecdotal evidence that, hey, it's got, it accelerated about two years faster than we, we expected. So, which means is that the, all our businesses are, even the small ones are relying on technology a lot more than before. So, you know, you hear about like drones, for example, doing the delivery, but, and even the Kroger, I think have launched a, a delivery service um, about a couple of months ago uh, um, to you know deliver groceries in the area as well. But you know one of the risks, obviously, in the drone is that it could crash and hurt people. And it actually happened in Switzerland, so they're kind of re-examining the program as well. So and of course the famous ransomware that we heard about, solar wind colonial pipeline, it actually increased the gas price 
because of ransomware attack. And those kinds of things are kind of the emerging risk that insurers are watching out for uh, that didn't exist before. Interesting because as you said, as we increasingly use technology and everything we do, digitization pushed us to, to spend a lot of time at home. Mm -hmm. uh, cyber is becoming more and more prevalent. And so therefore risks and the emerging risks that a lot of insurers need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you about climate, climate risks? Because we've seen since the beginning of the year, a big interest around climate change and climate action. What's your view on the topic, David? It, it, the climate, it, um, it's something that's been, the PNC industry has been watching for some time, right? You know, the, the, it, it, the fact that the 100 year event happens every year tells us that climate is indeed changing. So we are impacting our global climate and it is one of the uh, you know, biggest issue that we need to solve. Um, and it's, you know, it's right now, I think that California is again going through a drought and fire again as well. So it's a major impact that's just getting intensifying uh, for insurers to deal with and need to get ahead. Uh, but it, it, you know, beyond just climate, you know, there are other risks that, you know, they may not be new, but, you know, that we're beginning to discover. I mean, a good, interesting example is, remember that ship that's stuck in Suez Canal? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, and, you know, again, the COVID kind of exposed the risk of interconnectedness and Suez Canal also exposed uh, the risk of how interconnected as we are and the, in the, um, the risk of supply chain that's globally spanning, you know, just having that ship block that one waterway for a couple of days, the world was losing 10 billion in trays every day. I mean, even the gas price again went up because of that, because that's a you know, major route. So um, it is, it, you know, for the insurers, you know, this is a really interesting time that they're beginning to see a lot of the new risk emerging as well as uh, the you know, foundational kind of the risk that, uh, that always been there and it's getting, you know, take, having more attention than before. So you are talking about emerging risk and recently I've had a few discussion around transition risk, which is linked to um, the climate, economy, environmental risk, and, and much more than that. So when you look at the world we are in, uh, David, and all this change and actually new opportunities, mm -hmm. what does it mean in terms of technology advancement we need to pay attention to? Oh, absolutely. So there, there are a lot of disruptive technologies, but I'll talk about three today. So IoT, artificial intelligence, and hybrid cloud. Okay. So IoT first. So there are 10 billion IoT devices, and it's going to triple by 2025. So that means there will be four IoT devices for every person on Earth. We are surrounded by them already. Right? Our home, we have smoke detector, heat detector, you know, kind of thermostats, and then light bulbs and even doorbells. Um, and this aside from the phone and smartwatches, and then our car, as we mentioned, is already becoming a full of sensors. And, you know, in fact, the car is essentially, you know, like a computer on a wheel now, and it's going to be more and more so. So, but for insurers, this is a great news. This means that it, it, these are the source of real-time data about its risk. So it opens the door to kind of unimaginable capabilities like predicting the loss before, um, therefore able to prevent it or reduce the damage. A whole new kind of product, like where your premium changes constantly according to change in risk. So, and next is artificial intelligence. I mean, this is one of the hottest topic among insurers because AI capability has advanced enough to make real impact on everyday operation. Here's some examples. Okay. For customer service, 
AI is being deployed to handle customer requests through chatbots or natural language. And it's no longer like proof of concept or experiment. In fact, you know, IBM Watson AI is so reliable. We're offering it for free for share of benefits that client will, will gain. And for insurers, AI not only cuts customer service costs, but also help detect fraud, speed up, you know, on the writing and reduce potential even bias, you know, in, in things that they do. And the third is hybrid cloud. So this is the infrastructure that underpins all this. Okay. So when established insurers, the current and likely future infrastructure is a mix of public cloud, private cloud, and on-prem infrastructure. Okay. I haven't met a client who doesn't have a cloud strategy. It's, it's awesome. Everybody has one you know, in their house. But I also haven't met a client who have successfully you know, completed their journey to one cloud. It's just silly talk. In fact, you know, many large insurers still rely on grow mainframe, believe it or not, for most of their critical applications. So, you know, and they also use SaaS stuff like Salesforce, Adobe, and ServiceNow. And, and, and at the same time, having some of the workload move to a cloud. So the insurer you know, needs a hybrid cloud architecture that can support the portability of the workload across all these different you know, environments we just talked about, cloud or otherwise, and automating the deployments of the workload to put the work where it needs to be performing the best. So, you know, David, we often talk about InsureTech, right? Leading InsureTechs, which are out there. And I know, Everybody has different views, but you know, right now the unicorn have generated around 75 billion of valuation, mm -hmm. which is not insignificant in mm -hmm. insurance. You know, it keeps some of our insurers awake at night. Uh, at the same time, big tech is still working on out how they are going to make insurance business model outdated. Some of them are right, as we know. However, as you know, there are only 100 potentially insure techs, which are considered as market leading today out of 5,000, 5,200 ventures which are there. So we are still a lot of work to do. So what does it say about innovation within insurance, David? Great question. So insurance, unfortunately, remains to be a difficult thing to innovate. I think insurance tech so far has proven that point. Okay, here's why. The revenue of the largest insured tech is around $100 million a year, okay? The hundredth, okay, one hundredth PNC is about over $700 billion a, uh, million dollars a year. So that's seven times that, okay? And most of the insured techs are still not profitable, unfortunately. So, in, and, and that's actually on the PNC side, Life in annuity gets way worse. <laughs> so you know it's uh, and you know and, and for the it, for for a person who's been around insurance uh, for some time, you know we talked about insurance being a cusp of disruption for I don't know maybe since I've joined. <laughs> so you know it it's not easy, you know. And insure tech, I think, certainly compared to, for example, our banking brethren it's proving that it's much tougher not to crack. But, and it, much of the insurance tech did make great progress, certainly on the property and casualty personal line products, okay? And the common themes are better experience with more product flexibility, okay? And that are enabled by heavy use of big data and advanced analytics, and especially AI talked about, and IoT devices, like telematics are major enablers, as you see from growth of use-based car insurance, like Betro Miles and other. Right? And then all are digital natives and mobile first. And most important, their core system are all brand new because they're just new insure tech with ultra modern capabilities, not like the decade old legacies that established insurers you know, have to deal with. And I think, and that's why I think. I'm gonna contradict myself. 
insurance is finally <laughs> on the cusp of major disruption. Okay, <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> I'm not giving both out of myself now. Okay. Great. <laughs> uh, the, the pace of technological innovation is accelerating. Okay, as we discussed, IoT, AI, hybrid cloud, okay, and needed core technology are advancing by leaps and bounds. Okay, and number two, COVID has accelerated digitization of our society. And third, and most of all, the partnership between insured techs and established insurers are growing quickly. It shows that insurers are open to disruptive changes from outside, which wasn't always the case before. And insured tech, you know, realizing that insurance by nature favors long established brands, um, and wants to work closer with insurers. I mean, after all, you know, as a consumer, you know, insurance is something that you plan to use sometime decades later. So you want to work with a company that's been around for a very long time, which insure tech, unfortunately, are not by definition. So, and, you know, and this is one of the reasons why even IBM ourselves are planning to partner much closer with insure tech like Lemonade, Metro Mile, Next, and Root, and others um, to kind of work together and harness the power to, you know, the, to, for more innovative insurance industry. This is amazing news. Um, <laughs> as we, you know, InsurTech, it's still, you know, immature and, and new. Um, the, the term itself, InsurTech, came about around 2014, 2015. And so what has happened, even though insurance has been ripe for innovation for many years more than that, is that it actually pushed, I think, big companies to acknowledge that new digital technology are here to stay mm -hmm. and the customers are asking for it. Mm -hmm. Which takes me, David, to another set of topics I would like to address with you, mm -hmm. which is the elderly and the young. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the youngs, mm -hmm. youngsters. Absolutely. So once we look at uh, the problem from our society's perspective, you know, starting with the millennials, what have you seen occur during the past 12 months, David, um, because we talk about financial asset planning, we talk about savings, we talk about asset management, we talk about crypto. You know that I actually opened a crypto account because I needed to understand what this oh, thing was okay. about. So I'm being educated as well. But it's all about the democratization of investment. And so I'd love to hear your views Mm -hmm. on where we are when we think about the millennials, the Gen Z and finance and insurance. Absolutely. All right, so who are millennials? Ah, so they're the biggest segment we have right now, okay? So compared to previous generations that came ahead before them, they're better educated, they're culturally diverse and they grew up on internet. But unfortunately, they're the first generation to do worse financially. So they were impacted by the cyclical financial disasters like Great Recession uh, some decade or so ago. College costs soared, where the student debt is now a national crisis. Job became more insecure with a concept of lifetime employment being replaced by gig economy. And they're not even getting the fair share of the historical stock market bull run happening right now because much of the asset is owned by the older generation. <laughs> so I think this is why, you know, some of the popularity of cryptocurrency and meme stock among millennials are kind of the byproduct of this economic insecurity. So like as for kind of cryptocurrency, for example, I mean, you know, it, I'm not a, an investor in it, um, I guess I'm still a bit of a skeptical, to be honest. Um, I think it's a, it, it, it is certainly a fully digital with potential for outsized gain in terms of investment, okay? And in fact, some of the early investors made a fortune out of like, you know, Bitcoin already. Um, 
So for economically disadvantaged digital natives like millennials, the attraction seems to be almost natural. But unfortunately, you know, crypto doesn't have interesting value, intrinsic value, trades are kind of the emotion and momentum driven. And so far, you know, it's been great at illegal financial transactions like cyber ransom, but <laughs> not much since, unfortunately. And for meme stock like, you know, AMC, um, you know, it, it, it was kind of the fairy tale of small investors digitally banding together to defeat the giant of evil hedge fund, right? The short squeeze they ran and hedge funds losing billions of dollars because of that. And, you know, it, it, as I mentioned, it even got me to scan through Reddit for investment news time to time. <laughs> but the problem is obviously the story didn't end there. Uh, you know, the, the millennial investor stayed on and share price is still about 45 bucks and it was $2 in January. Um, so AMC, you know, rightly wrongly took advantage of that and issued like 100 million more shares um, to, and at the same time warning the investor of the danger of buying it. So they basically said, don't buy our stock, but here's 100 million more. <laughs> but anyway, you know, talk about irrational exuberance. Um, but from the insurance perspective, millionaires are the strategic segments, okay? But first, the great news for insurers, the life insurance application among millionaires surged during COVID. So it's like nothing like a global pandemic to remind people of their mortality. In um, in reality, the young families actually need more life insurance, more than the old, uh, because, you know, they have loved ones who will need to fend for themselves much longer than the elders who, you know, are generally more financially secure. And they're very much open, they're born on internet, they're digital, they're unhappy with status quo, and are willing to try new things. So they're kind of the perfect for innovative products. So hence they're targeted heavily by insurtechs. And obviously, you know, they are the largest segment as I mentioned with rising needs and bigger and more insurance products. So they're like perfect for insurers to target. So how can insurance industry help millennials? Uh, there are many ways, but kind of two ideas. PNC insurtechs are well on its way to figuring it out, I think. Um, with better experience and product flexibility, kind of as we kind of talked about before. And for life and annuity, I think that the path is to help the millennials with financial wellness, you know, grow the asset while mitigating investment risk, prepare the financial retirement, along with, you know, traditionally, traditional mitigating, you know, the consequences of life's event, like, you know, term insurance. That's great. And you know, when we talk about millennials, we also include often Gen Z. And whether we look at one or the other, um, one is digital enabled or a digital savvy, while, while the other one is digital native. Mm -hmm. And so what you are saying is we need to listen to them. And uh, they want education, right? When we look at financial services, but also access to digital offers, which fits with their way of life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that is the future. I mean, it, it even, um, even among the older generation, which we'll talk about soon, um, you'd be surprised here that they are very digital too. Just because you're over 65 doesn't mean that you don't use a computer. In fact, the average age of Facebook, if I remember, is like getting closer to 40 or something like that, 35, 40. So yeah, it's not the young folks left Facebook. It's all the old folks who's hanging around. <laughs> Interesting. So actually let's talk about the elderly, David. Um, so what are the challenges faced by our society when we think about the elderly? Uh, you know, what are the major aging issues we need to solve for uh, when we think about this segment? and how technology can help us all. Um, you know, whether, you know, I'm not too young, but not too young. <laughs> you know, wrinkle-free face, <laughs> but you know, who knows? I need to start planning for those things. So tell us, how can we integrate a better life for the elderly? 
using uh, technology. Absolutely. I, I'm speaking between Zen Zs. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, so the aging is the one of the biggest social force across Western world. Okay. The good news is that the advancement advancement in medical science has conquered much of the physical element. So we're living longer uh, than ever before. So in 1980, for example, there were about 30,000 people globally who were over 100, okay? Now there's over 570,000 people globally and it's rising rapidly, over 100. And if a couple reaches 65 together, it's a 50-50 chance that one of them will live past 90. So the great news again is that even after retirement, there's a whole lifetime that you can enjoy. Okay? Now, the bad news is that we are living longer than ever before. <laughs> so we as human had never lived this long before. So this is like a whole new thing for us actually. So, and the, one of the biggest challenges we're finding is that our mind cannot keep up with our longevity of our body. So with the increase in lifespan, there is a dramatic rise in dementia. So for, if you're over 85, half will show some sign of dementia. And unfortunately for women, two third are women in the case. And Alzheimer is kind of the primary cause. And unfortunately, there's no known cure yet. Even the new treatment that was just approved, it's gonna Edelheim or something like that. And it's still surrounded by controversy. In other words, we're, we can live longer than before, but our healthy old age hasn't improved much. So financially, now, because we live longer than ever before, we need to save more than ever before for retirement. And most of the retirees just have not done that. Um, and which kind of highlights the importance of social security for folks in US and you know, other social safety net in other Western countries as well. And the, another emerging financial burden that kind of related to what we talked about is long-term care. So this is the care you need if you cannot do certain basic activities in you to live day to day, like eating, moving, bathing, things like that, right? So in the couple of kind of, kind of shocking statistics or unfortunate statistics is that half of folks who, who are 65 or older will need long-term care for two years at least. And 20% will live will need a lot more than two years. And the long-term care facility in US costs over $100,000 a year. It's expensive. And on top of that, the COVID has exposed the nursing homes to be a extremely vulnerable a place to be. I mean, it, you've probably seen these heartbreaking photos of how the elders trap on the other side of the window um, lonely and the family couldn't reach them because of the COVID and many of them have passed away alone just like that. So, and, you know, along with kind of escalating, you know, healthy costs and, you know, obesity and all that, it's contributing to kind of the challenges. So, so how can now back to insurance, so how can insurance industry solve this problem? One major concept is called aging in place. So this is, so we live in a world that is built and built for young. But as we age, you know, we want to live where we've been living. You know, we want to grow old in our house, near our family and friends and maintain our social network. So what we need is to transform our day-to-day -day living environment in a way that we can not only live as a young, but also grow old in it as well. And that is the concept behind aging in place. So kind of the IoT technology we talked about, this is one of the central kind of capability. So we can install variety of sensors, whether it's a motion sensor, contact center, heat leak, bio, can be 
you know, installed around the house and to monitor the elders and provide help just in time. So this allows elders to stay at home and then be independent and keep their social network. And at the same time, be able to get the help they need that was only available in nursing homes before. And in fact, IBM has been running uh, such a technology in Europe for a number of years already. And another one more financial is called wealth accumulation. So, it, so the concept here is that after a lifetime of asset accumulation, when you retire, you enter the accumulation phase, which means that you're using the retirement savings to generate income, to replace the income that you used to get by working. So the major opportunity here is that the much of the middle class are underserved by financial advice. So as they retire, um, the, the unfortunate statistics is that they rely so much on solely on social security that after even like 15, 18 years, much of the life savings are, sits there unspent because they just don't know what's safe to spend. So they just don't spend it. So they're, you know, they're just missing out on uh, the fruits of their labor through their lifetime. So this is where we can apply the robo-advisor concept where we can use a technology to provide retirement accumulation advice to those middle-class retirees who otherwise wouldn't be able to get such quality advice from the human advisor because they're just not cost-effective. So that is a white space opportunity that the insurers can help. With aging in place and accumulation, there are tremendous opportunities that insurers can help and lead and reap great benefits from. This is fascinating. So we covered the trend and we looked at technology and then we looked at the younger generation as the millennials and the elderly and the application of technology for both segments. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for that, David. As conclusions, I would love to hear from you. How should we go about creating a little bit of a roadmap for success? You know, what are the things we need to know as executive of big companies and executive of small companies that you could share with us? What is your checklist? Absolutely, Successful. here's my checklist. So one certain thing about future is its uncertainty. So each insurer obviously will have to chart its own course, but there are things that every successful insurer will have in common, okay? Um, they mentioned three. First, is a maniacal focus on customer and delivering the customer experience above and beyond its competitors, okay? And we talked about the monumental challenges faced by, it, by our society, young and old, and those are also kind of the blue water opportunities that insurers can um, solve for and reap great benefits. Second is ability to innovate get through the cycle faster, learn more from each cycle and go on the offensive, okay? Number three is the mastery of technology. Certainly the disruptive technology like AI, hybrid cloud, IoT, we talked about, but just as important is modernizing their core legacy system. So it becomes a differentiating capability and not an inhibitor. So, you know, we, we discussed how our society is going through like major structural changes while facing enormous challenges. I think the insurers are in a perfect position to lead us to a wonderful future. I think this is an exciting time to be an insurance professional. Remember, future starts today, always. As you say, David, it's a fascinating and wonderful time to be in insurance. I remember the time one of the insurer I used to work with just five years ago said to me, Sabine, help us make insurance sexy. I think when I look at insurance today and all the challenges we need to solve for, mm -hmm. insurance is an interesting place to be. Absolutely. 
this is insurance is interesting. It is what we need. And most of all, it is what we need to solve and create solve the biggest challenges and create the best future possible for our society. Thank you, David. Thank you for this wonderful webinar, full of thoughts and full of understanding as to how IBM is developing solutions and technologies to help us face the uh, a new insurance future. And well, uh, hopefully we'll be able to know more. Well, thank you so much. And I enjoyed the conversation and absolutely looking forward to more. And if anybody wants to hear or talk to David, you will be able to find David Kwon on LinkedIn. So do not hesitate to connect with David. Thank you, everyone.